Will these reactions undergo SN1, SN2, E1, or E2? Instead of a blindly memorized complicated flowchart, let's use this simple four-part checklist. This is all you have to memorize. I go through each checklist item in detail on my website linked below at layoffersci.com slash checklist. And now we're going to put it all together. The alkyl halide is alkyl carbon chain and halide halogen, typically chlorine, bromine, and iodine that we're attacking in the substitution or elimination reaction. We're specifically looking for two carbons, the alpha and the beta. If I have an alkyl chain, the first thing I want to do is recognize the location of the halogen, in this case a bromine. The carbon that holds the halogen, that's the zero carbon or the alpha, and the carbon one away from the alpha is my beta. If this is my alpha, one away, beta, another beta, and another beta. The alpha carbon can be primary, secondary, or tertiary, a topic I explain with a pencil trick link below. If my leaving group is sitting on a tertiary carbon, the molecule is way too sterically hindered for a nucleophile to come in and attack. This is why a tertiary alkyl halide will not undergo an SN2 reaction. A primary alkyl halide will not give up its leaving group to form a primary carbocation because that is way too unstable, which automatically rolls out our SN1 and E1. Since the secondary leaving group is not sterically hindered and will form a carbocation, it tells us nothing except that your professor is evil. I mean, your professor just wants you to think harder. As we go through the checklist, if you're not comfortable with the specifics, like when a nucleophile attacks or a carbocation forms, make sure you go back and watch my entire series, which you can find on my website, along with a substitution elimination practice quiz and cheat sheet linked below, layerforsci.com slash SNE. Again, that's layerforsci.com slash SNE. The beta carbon is relevant in the elimination reaction to help us determine one, if the reaction can even take place, and two, if we have multiple beta carbons, which one do we attack? For example, methyl bound to a leaving group has an alpha carbon, but no beta. If I have no beta carbon, I have no beta hydrogen, no beta hydrogen, nothing to eliminate, no E1 or E2 reaction. But if I have more than one beta carbon, specifically more than one beta hydrogen, Zaitsev rule tells us the more substituted carbon will form the major product, and the less substituted carbon will give us the minor product. The exception, of course, is with a big bulky base that will give us the Hoffman rather than Zaysev product. The most common question here is how do I tell the difference between a nucleophile and a base? And while I have not one, but two videos on this topic at layerforsci.com slash checklist, I challenge you to change your question. Is it a strong or weak attacker? In other words, will I have a one-type SN1E1 or a two-type SN2E2 reaction? The two in SN2NE2 tells us by molecular reaction, two molecules reacting at the same time so quickly that I have no intermediates. This is because the attacker is so strong, it doesn't wait around for a carbocation to form and doesn't allow for any intermediates. Remember, happy, stable, unreactive unhappy, unstable, reactive. And what makes a molecule unhappy? Charge. Charge is a burden. When you see a negative charge, that molecule wants to attack, making it a strong attacker. For example, OH- or any RO- like methanol. Having that negative charge gives us a two-type reaction, ruling out SN1 and E1. SN1 and E1 are unimolecular reactions. That means one molecule reacts at a time, giving us multiple steps and one or more intermediates. This is because we have weak molecules just taking their time, waiting around, and finally reacting. This can only happen if I have no bully to rush it along with weak attackers. What makes a molecule weak? Something happier, more stable, typically neutral molecules. For example, water or alcohol like methanol, having no charge makes them weak, ruling out the two type reactions like SN2 or E2. As for nucleophile versus base, I typically look at everything else to determine if it's substitution or elimination, 
with a couple of exceptions. The triple B, or big bulky base, is so sterically hindered it can't approach the alpha carbon and plucks the hydrogen from the nearby beta carbon and if possible, the less substituted beta hydrogen because that is so much easier to reach. The most common example terp butoxide has a negative oxygen and oh my goodness, look at what's attached. It's a four part checklist, but you'll probably have solved half your practice problems with just these two. Are you with me so far? If yes, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel and hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss out on any new videos and let's continue. Looking at the solvents is a little tricky, so let's break it down. We're choosing between a polar protic versus aprotic solvent. I explained the solvents in detail on layoverside.com slash checklist, but for now recognize that a protic solvent has very partially positive hydrogens. For example, the hydrogens on water and ammonia, where the aprotic has very neutral hydrogens sitting on carbon, such as the hydrogens here on DMSO. The partially positive hydrogens in protic solvents will attempt to stabilize any charge in solution, such as a carbocation or a negative charge, but the aprotic solvent without those partially positive hydrogens won't do anything and in fact they make the molecules more angry. Because the protic solvent will stabilize the carbocation, SN1 and E1 reactions prefer protic solvents. But that does not rule out our two type reactions because an E2 reaction will also prefer a protic solvent. This is where a lot of students get confused. If it's a one type reaction, we can have SN1 and E1. If it's a two type reaction, it's just the E2 favored in a polar protic solvent. Let's take a look why. If I have a strong attacker like OH- and it's acting as a nucleophile, if I dissolve this in a polar aprotic solvent, that oxygen has nothing to react with except for the alpha carbon, and so it goes looking for that partially positive carbon to attack and create a substitution reaction. But if I take this hydroxide, and now I dissolve it in a protic solvent like water, the oxygen is still looking for something positive, but now it gets distracted by the hydrogen on water. And when it grabs that hydrogen from water, and gives that oxygen back the electrons, I form a new neutral water molecule and another hydroxide, which now goes looking for another hydrogen and another hydrogen. And if it's just looking for hydrogen, it'll eventually find that beta hydrogen, pluck it off, and give me my E2 reaction. The leaving group is more a formality on the checklist, where it's not about choosing which reaction, but rather, will the reaction take place? What is a good leaving group? Something that not only leaves, but stays gone. If I kick something out and it comes back, terrible leaving group. Picture that friend who leaves, but has just one more thing to say, and just one more thing to say, and they never leave, terrible leaving group. And if that's the case, ask, can I bribe this molecule? Can I protonate with acid? Can I add a big bulky group like a tosylate? Even though it's a four part checklist, you'll often see heat in the reaction. Do not memorize that heat means elimination even though heat does favor elimination. In the energy diagram series linked below at layerforsci.com slash SNE diagram, we see that our reactants begin at a certain energy level and our products are more stable at a lower energy level. But we don't simply go from reactant to product. Instead, we see the energy go up and then come down. This is called the activation energy and differs for every reaction. If you have a slow reaction like SN1 and E1, they have a high activation energy. For a reaction like SN2 and E2, the product of the SN2 reaction has more entropy and is therefore considered less stable, where the E2 product has less movement, less entropy, and considered more stable. However, it takes a lot more energy to form that more stable product. It's a higher upfront cost for a better payout but I put more energy in the form of heat into the system, I can afford that greater activation energy investment to give me a more stable product, which is why heat will favor E2 over SN2. With all of this in mind, let's go back to our initial practice set. Let's start with problem number one. I have a primary alpha carbon. This would give me unstable carbocations. I rule out SN1 and E1. My beta carbon has hydrogen nothing else to rule out. 
my attacker doesn't have a charge or does it anytime you see an na plus that's a positive spectator sitting with an oh minus minus negative charge strong attacker two type reaction well, i've already ruled out s1na1 my solvent dmso dimethyl sulfoxide is a polar aprotic solvent which favors sn2 over e2 bromine is a good leaving group easily kicked out for an sn2 product for number two i have a tertiary alpha carbon which rules out sn2 i have beta carbons with hydrogen telling us nothing so let's move on to the attacker once again NaOH is just Na plus and OH minus. OH minus is strong, negative, a two-type reaction. I rule out SO1 and E1. I'm not given a solvent, but I already know that it's not SN2. And chlorine is a good leaving group. So I'm good to go with an E2 reaction. Number three, same starting molecule. We already know. Tertiary alpha, no SN2. Beta hydrogens are good, leave them where they are. My attacker, wait a minute. I don't have an attacker, or do I? My solvent, CH3OH, can also double as my attacker in what is called a solvolysis reaction, where the solvent participates in the reaction, and CH3OH as an attacker is neutral, happy, stable, unreactive, very slow, which means we'll have a one-type reaction. As a solvent, CH3OH is polar protic, which will stabilize carbocation intermediates, Chlorine is a good leaving group, and I have no heat. Am I missing something on the checklist? I'm stuck with two reactions. Is it SN1 or E1? And the answer is both. Substitution and elimination, especially unimolecular, are often in competition with each other. And so my answer will include SN1 with an OCH3 and E1 with a pi bond. Say I change it up and give you the reactant and the product but ask you to figure out what reaction took place and the step-by-step -step mechanism. This is exactly what I cover in my next video, which you can find linked below, or by visiting my website, where you can find the entire substitution elimination video series, practice quiz, and cheat sheet, layerforsci.com slash S-N-E. Again, that's layerforsci.com slash S-N-E.